Thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. And yes, I want to pick up on a sort of parallel story to the, perhaps the main focus of this conference, which is the application of an evidence-based approach uh, to public health. Now, I come from NICE, I'm the director of the Centre for Public Health at NICE. Um, just in case you think we've become the Admiralty, that is Admiralty Arch in London, we've just moved to the office next door to that, but uh, that doesn't make quite such a nice picture. Um, the other office is our place in Manchester. Now, uh, as many of you will know, we're an independent organisation. The part for which I'm responsible at NICE is that which is in bold there, developing guidance for our National Health Service and other organisations on the promotion of good health and the prevention of disease. The audiences for the guidance, and this has been going on since 2005, um, run right across these different organisations, from the National Health Service through local government, but also to the private sector, uh, the voluntary sector, the utilities, the transport system. In fact, any part of the um, infrastructure where the actions and activities of the actors therein will have a potential effect uh, on the health of the public. Of course, in the middle of next week, public health responsibility uh, in England shifts wholly for commissioning and some delivery to local authorities. And one of the big challenges that we've been working on over the last 12 months is how to meet that challenge as it moves wholesale into the local authority world. Now, just like our clinical work, the technology appraisals, the development of clinical guidelines, uh, for public health, there's a set of principles and procedures, processes and methods, the third edition of which was published last October. And you will find, if you look at that, that it has some of the very familiar tenets or precepts which NICE uses in order to do its work, to search the evidence base as comprehensively as possible, but also always to allow expert input, involvements of patients, carers, and in our case, members of the public representing either specific interests um, or representing groups such as ex-smokers or something of that kind. As with all nice work, there are independent advisory committees. It's not the technical people like me who are responsible for developing the guidance, but rather people like you who sit on our committees uh, along with lay people and receive the evidence which we've helped to put together. There's a consultation process, um, regular review, um, and, and an open, transparent, at least as open and transparent as you can make it. Uh, I think it would be foolhardy to suggest it's completely so, uh, but it certainly often feels very transparent in the sense that uh, once the press starts having a go, the patient groups and all the different special interests. Now, the task we took on from 2005, which was when NICE acquired its role in public health, was thought to be quite a simple one, which was to apply the principles of evidence-based medicine to public health. We knew we'd have to develop the methods to do that, that simply taking off the shelf a technology appraisal and trying to apply it to um, smoking cessation interventions, for example, probably wouldn't work. We'd have to develop the methods. And thus far, we've produced 43 different uh, public health pieces of guidance uh, with another 30 or so in the pipeline presently. Now, in attempting to apply this evidence-based medicine platform to public health, a number of what I've called their intriguing problems have emerged. And that's really the narrative I want to share with you this afternoon. What have those problems been? And perhaps I need to feed it back, because in trying to solve those problems, a number of other things have emerged, methodologically, perhaps even philosophically, which I think feed back to evidence-based medicine uh, in its more narrow uh, sense. Well, the original guiding principles uh, are very familiar, I think, to people in this room. To use the best available evidence to define a, pre a, a predefined question, to answer a predefined question. To formulate that question as far as possible using the PICO framework in which we specify the population, the intervention, the comparator and the outcome. Then search the evidence base uh, sensitively and comprehensively. Then assess the evidence that you find with particular reference to the maximization of internal validity. Use the principle of accumulating, accumulating evidence and synthesizing the accumulated evidence that you've got, and then producing the evidence-based recommendations. Now, perhaps one of the first problems we encountered um, is re with respect to the notion of a clearly defined question um, and the PICO framework. Because in many areas of public health, being able to define the population very precisely, 
being able to describe the intervention which you're interested in, let alone to find a comparator, save doing nothing at all, and even getting a handle on the outcome proves to be a rather slippery place and a rather difficult thing to do. Nevertheless, in some areas it works exceedingly well. And it works well where there are already plentiful studies about interventions that are well-defined or some other kind of public health actions that are described in the literature about the topic. So where you've got a decent evidence base to look at, not surprisingly, uh, it, you get on pretty well. Even better, where a good proportion of those um, accounts are based on trials. And it, uh, it's been the case that in, in some of the areas we work on, notably smoking, uh, tobacco control, um, screening and brief interventions for alcohol, there is a plentiful trial-based evidence um, base for us to look at. Where that PICO framework can be applied, <clears throat> it works well. Uh, and again, in alcohol and tobacco, that's been quite a useful place for us to go. But, and this is the real problem that I've had, is that many of the things we've been asked to investigate by the Department of Health, by ministers, and just for the record, uh, NICE doesn't choose the topics it does itself. Uh, it comes through a complicated process signed off in the end by the Secretary of State. And many of the things that different Secretaries of State have sent us to do haven't, have been in the form of a big public health problem in search of a solution rather than a public health intervention uh, in search of evidence of effectiveness. And that's quite a significant shift. So, for example, we receive referrals on uh, finding the best evidence to tackle the problem of health inequalities. Pretty tall order um, if you think about the kinds of things we would normally do. The system also works quite well. The basic principles work quite well. And the variables described in the evidence are based on biological or psychological individuals rather than being about relationships between groups of individuals. I should add that when we started this, it was very clear from what ministers asked us to do that NICE would pay particular attention to the question of health inequalities. But many studies about health inequalities are not about biological uh, or psychological individuals. They're about relationships between social groups in a wider society. And I'll illustrate this point by drawing out the fact that the variables that we have to tackle are of two kinds, what I've called here individual and relational. And typically, an individual variable, the sort of thing uh, we're very familiar with, a measurement of blood pressure or one's height, uh, a measure on a personality scale, uh, a measure of morbidity, something of that kind, one's occupation, and certainly one's biological sex, could be thought of as individual variables. But we're also interested in social class, gender, social status, tribe and caste, for example, which are relational uh, variables. They're about relationships between groups of people. And one of the problems in the public health literature is that some variables actually can be both, but many relational variables are treated as if they were individual ones, as if you could reduce down health inequalities to the question of a measure of occupation, for example. Now, isn't necessarily a problem so long as you look behind the, the, the way the knowledge has been put together, um, as philosophers would have it, ontologically and epistemologically. I love to get that word epistemology into the talks I do. Um, I was feeling a bit epistemological last night. As long as you keep in mind um, the differences, but of course it's very easy, and given that many of the authors preparing primary papers don't, it gets, um, it gets a bit a bit difficult to do the assessment and the appraisal that one needs to do. Furthermore, and this is linked to what I've just said, distinguishing between explanations um, about individual disease outcomes, why Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones happens to have the particular disease that they do, and the social level explanation, why there are particular patterns of illness in the population they're not explained by the same set of causal factors. You don't get to the patterning of health inequalities simply by aggregating up all the individual events in the, popula in, in, in the population as a whole. Uh, there are two, if you like, analytic levels as distinct as the biological and the physical um, also operate here. And sometimes the literature sort of swithers about, slips between these two areas in a rather unhelpful way. But so long as the analysis remains at one level or the other, you know, you can do the science. 
It also works quite well, and we've, all, we've had from the beginning uh, the uh, task of applying the principles of health economics to the public health interventions. Is it good value for money for the exchequer to do X, Y, or Z? And so obviously, where there's plentiful economic information around, we can do that. But what, of course, we learned very quickly were two things about health economics and public health. First of all, public, uh, there isn't much by way of public health economics. There isn't much by way of theory, and there isn't much by way of empirical studies of costs, for example. But neither is there much of a discipline of public health economics either to help us get out of that hole. So we've had to do quite a lot of novel economic work with our economists, um, with economists from different universities around the country, in order to put that, uh, to fill that gap. And then thirdly, it works well where there's plentiful information about the, how the intervention was done in practice. And this echoes very much the, the last speaker's point about implementation. You can't implement something if you don't know what was done in the first place. And perhaps you won't be surprised to learn that very often the primary research papers do not describe in sufficient detail what the intervention was, what the action was, in order for one to be um, confident that you could go forward with it. It's not described, the fidelity, um, the, the, um, the description of the intervention remains often at best vague, at worst useless. And that turns out to be a real problem. It's a reporting problem. One I think we got past in clinical medicine uh, several decades ago. It still remains an intrinsic problem in public health. The process also works well when we're dealing with relatively downstream uh, stuff, individual behavior change. There's a lot of um, research on that, and there's lots of description on it. But when you get to looking at the upstream interventions, talking about changes in taxation, or talking about changes um, in benefit arrangements, for example. And many people, I do apologize, I keep whacking that, um, many people argue that that's the way to deal with problems of health inequalities. The evidence base turns out to be a great deal more tenuous. It also works well where we can be confident about the causal pathway. We actually know what's going on between the intervention and the outcome. Now, schematically, one might think of it as this. Now, imagine X is a GP sitting in their surgery giving advice to Mr. Smith who's just come in about taking up a bit of exercise so Mr. Smith can lose a bit of weight and get a bit better chance of a, a cardiovascular fitness and perhaps reduce his risk of heart attack. Well, of course, that's a simple intervention, X to Y, improved health at Y, but let's just consider that for a moment. It breaks down into a number of steps, a few steps here. Step A might be the ability of the general practitioner to explain to Mr. Smith that exercise is a good thing. Not all GPs are very skilled at that kind of thing. Point B might be Mr. Smith actually believing that it'll do them some good. There are many people who don't believe that physical activity can be any good for you at all. It makes you hot, sweaty, sore, uncomfortable and tired. How could that possibly be doing you any good? Um, kind of commonsensical but true. C. Mr. Smith believes it and is going to do something about it. D, Mr. Smith goes out and buys a, a new tracksuit, a lycra vest, and some running jogging uh, shoes, and Y takes up a bit of jogging. But the road to these public health behavior change interventions are paved with all sorts of other alternative routes. And if point D was the purchase of the running kit, outcome might be K, which is a wardrobe full of running kit having not the slightest bit of an impact on the cardiovascular fitness. And that's a simple intervention, brief, intervice, brief, brief advice in a GP surgery. Imagine some of our referrals have been about what happens if we do changes to the school curriculum related to sex education, X, and Y, the use of a condom on sexual debut three years later. Just imagine how complicated that causal pathway uh, would be. Further, most of the studies, insofar as they deal with this at all, will tell you about the relationship between X and Y and nothing about the intervening steps along the way, the A's, the B's, the C's, the D's, and all the rest of it. So we get a nice statistical relationship between X and Y, though probably not knowing very clearly what X was, um, but nothing much about all these processes that go on in between. It's a complex behavioral problem, in other words, um, which we've not done very well so far at 
<coughs> pulling it all together in such a way that we can understand these things. But the problems go deeper than that still, or the challenge goes deeper than that still, because in many of these areas that I'm talking about where we've done guidance, there is actually a dearth of studies, uh, outcome studies, answering the question, what works at all? Uh, it's, we've not been very good at studying those things and reporting them. Um, and that's a worldwide problem, not just a, a problem associated with the UK. And still fewer of the studies allow us to answer with confidence what would work for whom, which population group, which subgroup in the population, um, under what circumstances, and so on. The, the, the Ray Paulson question, which is associated with his realistic evaluation approach. And the evidence, such as it is, is often far too precise to determine the nature of the relationship between the intervention and the out outcome, the, the stages along my schematic causal pathway. Well, what then about health inequalities? Um, back in 2005, this was a big-ticket issue. It remains a big-ticket issue. The current um, the British government is still committed to tackling the question of health inequalities. And we've, we've, we've tried to um, identify interventions which will have a differential effect on health inequalities in some kind of way. Now, if you imagine the health gradient as described by Sir Michael Marmot um, as in this schematic way, it tends to be it's a bit more curvy linear than that, generally speaking, but we know that there's an association between good health and higher social status however you measure either health or social status, and it dips down toward the bottom. So what should we be seeking to do in terms of our public health approach? Well, the first place we obviously thought about was the Jeffrey Rose type curve, which is, well, we need to talk to the whole population, not just the population at highest degrees of risk, and we should be doing, in true Rose fashion, shifting the gradient of risk downwards for everybody so that we see uh, an overall effect on the population. So that was our starting preset, to see if you could put that into practice. Can we put that into practice in some way? Because if we could, perhaps at best what we would see is the health gradient improving for everybody at the same rate across the population as a whole. And I suppose if we, had, if we felt it was possible to do that, we'd consider ourselves successful. But the problem is this that very often our interventions have this effect. In other words, they improve the health of those already in better health on average more quickly than those in the worst situation. So actually what you're doing by your public health intervention is making health inequalities worse rather than better. It has a perverse consequence. What we're seeking to do, of course, is that, to shift the gradient round. And this, is that, these, uh, this principle is actually enshrined in the white paper, in the, in the legislation, to improve the health of the most disadvantaged faster than the population as a whole. So you swing the gradient round. There's a real problem, there's a real scientific problem, however, with this. Not so much the, the conceptualization of it, but in, in, in broad terms, we don't know enough about what constitutes the social differences along the x-axis to be able to pinpoint with very much precision what kind of interventions would have this kind of effect on the gradient. Our knowledge, in other words, of the nature of our population is still pretty crude. We use socioeconomic status or income. Perhaps we get a bit more, um, a, a bit more sophisticated by introducing ethnicity. But how those different variables, how those different social characteristics interact with each other to produce the health effects with which we're so familiar um, is not well researched at all. And certainly, it doesn't exist in the primary research literature relating to interventions to give us a, a forensic take on it. So we have to model it, we have to work it through, uh, we have to take an empirical approach. But certainly, the literature doesn't give you uh, the solution. Another point that, uh, that has been a, a significant challenge to us is the hierarchy of evidence itself, something this audience is familiar with, I'm sure, and this is the version from uh, edition two of the research, uh, the methods and process manual that we use in public health with the traditional um, types of studies uh, at the top of it. Our difficulty is that, of course, the core idea in the hierarchy of evidence is the confidence that we can have about the relationship between the dependent and independent variables being free from bias, the internal validity question, an important question, of course. 
But that question is premised on the notion that the relationship between the variables is a real one, or at least you can hone it down in such a way uh, that you can be precise about the nature of the relationship. But as you, I'm sure you've gathered from the way I've been speaking about this, the variables of interest here exist within a very complex web of relationships empirically, um, and the notion of one variable acting on another in a single, simple way um, is, is, is an idea that's actually derived from a rather old-fashioned understanding of physics, not from the behavioral sciences, not from psychology, sociology, anthropology, and economics. So our committees have to help us out here, and this is the committee that did the work on uh, the prevention of cardiovascular disease at population level uh, uh, several years ago. And what we've learned and what we have to work with our committees is to work through the following. To fully appreciate the fact that the evidence doesn't speak for itself. It always requires interpretation. It always requires more than that which is there in the empirical uh, box of evidence that comes to the table. However well we've appraised it and indeed however good it is in the first place and some of it isn't that good. But we then hit perhaps the most significant problem of all, and I think it's a, a very interesting problem, which I do think comes back to um, th the more traditional uh, problems of evidence-based medicine and was echoed, I think, in some of the discussions in the early part of this morning uh, relating to interpretation beyond what the evidence might say. Now, while there are very well-defined scientific protocols and methods for doing scientific interpretation, what might think of as scientific interpretation, the methods and processes for understanding the inferences that we use to interpret evidence and the judgments which are used in the interpretation of evidence is not developed at all. We know it goes on, although we sometimes write our manuals and, and methods as if there isn't a problem of interpretation and inference, but we do it as human beings and we do it naturally as part of the scientific endeavor. But what we've been less good at is pinning down exactly what that might mean in practice. And what I want to end on is suggesting to you that I've come to the view, and I won't say this is a nice view, but I've certainly reached the view, that we use in this whole business three different types of judgment. And we have to work with our committees at NICE to try and to get them to recognize when they're using each of the different types of judgment. Now, the first sets of judgment are, in some senses, the easiest of what I've called here a priori analytic judgments. And these are the things relating to the methodological precepts, the notions of internal validity, reduction of bias, the things that are there in the hierarchy of evidence, and many of our statistical procedures. They're protocols and routines that we use and we can rely upon because a priori, we have decided in advance that's what we mean by the absence of bias, or that's what we mean by statistical significance, or whatever it might be. So that's one set of things that we use, and they're pretty clear when you look at them in the texts. Then there are what I've called um, a posteriori, after the event, synthetic judgments. And that's easy too, because that's the empirical evidence, the things that come, 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 come to us from the primary trials. But then there's another um, much more intriguing and difficult area of what I've called a priori before the event, synthetic judgments, bringing things together. That's what I mean by synthesis. And the sorts of things that come into play here, clinical judgment, the things that people bring to the table as a consequence of having practiced medicine or being a practiced researcher or whatever, knowledge, theory of various kinds, experience, and everyday observation. Now, I want to say to you, not that that last part of the judgment process is somehow poor, wrong, we should try and eliminate it, far from it. It's an intrinsic part of the scientific endeavor, but we've not been terribly good at describing how to manage it and what sorts of processes we need to put in place in order to determine whether the theories we are using are validated, important part of a, a traditional um, theoretical enterprise, or simply the kind of theory that I could hear in the saloon bar in my local pub um, on a Sunday afternoon. These are important, I suggest to you, because while I believe we've been extraordinarily good at de developing the methodological precepts in the first two of those types of judgment, we've been extraordinarily poor at describing the processes in the third. And I suppose I believe that in the next 10 years, it's an area where we need to turn our attention as a collective community um, of evidence-based uh, practitioners 
to see if we can work it out rather better than we've done to date. And there are some references describing the work. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you, uh, Richard Sates from Boston. Um, I wonder if there's a way that you factor in the likelihood that a known efficacious intervention uh, will in fact retain its effectiveness when it's, when it's disseminated. So if you have an aspirin at a particular dose, there's a fair likelihood that that dose will be given even, even though there may be adherence problems. But let's say behavioral counseling, it can be done terribly and it's difficult to translate it into practice. So can you factor that in somehow? Yeah, that's a very, very important point. It's, it's part of the external validity problem, if you like. Will it work in different places? But the, 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 the delivery of the intervention, as well as the intervention itself, are inextricably bound up in much of the work we're talking about. And your example of behavioral counseling is a case in point. And it's, it's all, well, I won't say it's impossible, but it's very, very difficult to control for those factors which, would, which will dissipate and um, will we'll make the efficacious intervention much less efficacious as a consequence of human behavior. You can think about protocols, you can think about training, you can think about a range of devices which will help you to do it, but in, in, in fundamental terms, it's the, we have, this echoes the previous talk in many ways, I think it's, although I've, I've emphasized in my talk all the things that make the evidence difficult, I wouldn't want you to think we know nothing, we actually know quite a lot. And the biggest problem of all has been implementing what we know in a way that retains that which we know to be effective is still effective. I, I, I'm sometimes quoted as saying, it, will it work on a wet Wednesday in Wigan? Um, and if we can be sure that it will, regardless of the way people behave, then we're on to a winner. But we've got very few of those. Yeah, Stephen Charcroft, geriatrician from Dunedin, New Zealand. Um, Reflecting on a subject you studiously avoided, which was breast cancer screening, <laughs> and taking the, um, the sort of synthetic aspects of a priori and a posteriori uh, decision making, if we'd done an entry poll and an exit poll from this conference to see how decisions had changed through the knowledge translation, what would you guess the outcome would be? What was that last point, sorry, the last part of the question? What would you have guessed, I don't know if you've been at the whole conference, but if you have, uh, and we've heard two or three presentations which have had their own contexts, <laughs> their, own looks, their own analysis of bias, uh, their own presumably weighting of the same evidence, but taking all that in consideration, what do you yeah. think an exit poll would look like if we looked at that particular subject? I'm uncertain, but I think had we done the entry and exit poll but ask people to distinguish between the three sorts of knowledge that one would apply to the problem and reflect upon the degree to which the knowledge that you bring on the basis of practice, the knowledge you bring on the basis of the empirical data, and the knowledge you bring on the basis of the scientific protocols. That might help to, I think it, my own view is at least, um, it, would ha it, it helps to unravel some of those things which make which often make it appear that you have an irresolvable scientific difference. In fact, you don't. What you have are different sets of interpretations being applied to the same material. Which doesn't answer the question, but I think it's the way I'd, I'd, I'd like to formulate it. Thank you for your diplomatic um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Mike Kelly, and then I've got an announcement to make. So thank, thank you. you very much indeed.